I pushed it. I think you put your finger right here. Are you ready? We're good. Sounds good. Everybody here okay? All right. I appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, okay, a good day. Good message this morning. I like what he said this morning about you can't, um, you can't complete the, the Great Commission if you don't have the Great Devotion. Um, and certainly what we're talking about with Revelation is looking at devotion. And tonight we're going to look at that specifically and looking at how uh, the earth, the people on the earth will finally be divided in their devotion. It, it'll, it'll be for sure one or the other. Uh, and we'll get into that as we talk about uh, these two characters tonight. I have quite a bit to go through uh, with you before we get into uh, actually what chapter 13 says. Uh, so we're going to go into some background and some explanation, uh, learn some things about the Antichrist. Uh, so let me let me go through just a couple of things and, and then, then we'll get into it. So um, again, our timeline, and we are right in the middle of the seven years. Uh, we're right at the Great Tribulation time period. And we'll talk a little bit more about why we know that tonight. We're still kind of in that uh, parenthetical uh, aspect of the last few chapters uh, where John is taking a break away from uh, the visions and what he has shared with us about the uh, judgment, the two series of judgments that have come, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. And then he kind of he goes in a different direction. And so last week we looked at chapter 12. We looked at the dragon and the woman and the, the child. And looked at the dragon being Satan, the woman being Israel, and the child being the Messiah. And we'll pick back up with that in a little bit uh, tonight. Again, we're going to pick back up once we get to chapter 15. So we're about three weeks away. We'll get back into some of the judgments that are going on. A lot of symbolism is coming up. Uh, I will tell you that. We'll get into some of that tonight. Uh, and and we, that's the challenge when you look at Revelation is what is to be taken literal and what is allegorical or, or uh, symbolic. And we've used this timeline the last several weeks, uh, and again, in the tribulation, and it just kind of lays out for us. We've talked about the Lamb and the witnesses, uh, the first half of the tribulation. We're going to get tonight, the second half of the tribulation, we're going to get to, uh, at the very end of our time in chapter 13, is going to talk about the mark of the beast and what that means and what that, what that spells out for the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And then we've been talking about how this tribulation time period is also Daniel's 70th week. And so these seven years, um, we're talking about the 70th week and what's going on. And we're going to see tonight some references again back to Daniel and what he saw coming forward. And then we're going to see where John is seeing the same thing, but seeing looking backwards. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see how Scripture, uh, how God works Scripture together that way. So Revelation 13, the dragon, the sea, and the land beast. Because we've got two different beasts, and you can find some really wild looking portrayals of what those beasts look like if you just go google and what's the beast of the sea and what's the beast of the land look like and none of those are accurate because i don't think that's really what he's seeing it is symbolic of what those things represent and we're going to work uh, through that tonight um, so these two beasts uh, of revelation uh, we got two different ones, and uh, one guy that I listened to referred to them as the d demonic duo, not the dynamic dynamic duo of, of uh, superheroes, but a demonic duo. And we're going to see that beast number one is described in the beginning of verse one. Beast number two will be described beginning in verse 11. One of them rises out of the sea. We'll talk about what does that mean. One of them rises out of the earth or the land, depending on your translation. We'll talk about what that means. Beast 1 is the Antichrist. Beast 2 is the false prophet, and we'll look at how we uh, know that. We know that um, lots of scripture talks about how this Antichrist will arise at the end of time. He will arise to oppose Christ. He will arise to oppose his followers. And lots of people have done that throughout history, but this will be in a larger scale than anyone has ever done that before. It's very likely, and we'll get into that tonight as we talk about the Antichrist and the descriptions of him, it's very likely that he is going to claim that he is the Messiah, that he is God. Remember back to the verses in Isaiah and Ezekiel, um, I think it's Isaiah, where, it, where one of those I will statements of Satan, I will make myself like the Most High. He wants to take the place of God, and everything that he presents is counterfeit to what, what God has. And we'll talk about some of that counterfeit um, aspects tonight. 
Um, Christ warned us about a lot of false prophets. Um, he warned about it in Mark chapter 13. Uh, we also have Daniel talking about that, the passage in Daniel chapter 9 where he talks about that abomination of desolation. We'll talk about that tonight, what, what that means and what that means the Antichrist is doing. Uh, this Antichrist is going to be a really, really powerful person. The Antichrist, Beast 1, is going to be the uh, political, military might, the power of the world. And the Beast 2, the false prophet, is going to be that, uh, a false spiritual leader. That's going to be his role. And we'll look at, at those roles and, and what that means. Uh, so we know that halfway through is when, if there's any question about who this person is and has risen to power and whether that is the fulfillment of script, scripture and the antichrist or not there will be no question halfway through the tribulation he will come at the beginning we'll talk about how he comes at the beginning again and initiates that false uh, covenant of peace with israel and really with the world and how three and a half years in he will break that promise break that peace agreement and will begin persecuting uh, jews an anti-semitic um, uh, approach like the world has never seen on a scale that we have never seen before so we have these two this is what the focus is tonight so a couple of facts about the antichrist that we want to look at is you know jesus is the promised offspring of the woman in genesis 3 15. If we go all the way back and uh, adam and eve have sinned and satan or satan is there the serpent is there and you remember in genesis 3 we have god pronouncing the consequences on the man and the woman and on Satan. And in Genesis 3.15, in the midst of all that, Christ is the promised offspring of the woman. Some translations say seed. But you also have in the same verse a reference to the seed of the serpent. And so it is a foreshadowing all the way there of the offspring or the seed of the serpent. The Antichrist is the seed of the serpent. Satan, again, tries to counterfeit every single work of God. Here's the verse. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed and hers. Between your offspring. He's talking to the serpent. Between your offspring or your seed. He will crush your head, meaning Christ, and you will strike his heel. Meaning he will attempt. He will attempt and believe that he is going to come out on top. Um, he tries to counterfeit everything. And his crowning piece of counter. Uh, counterfeit will be raising up this antichrist this person that will be a substitute for jesus christ he will present him as this is this is the messiah and we'll talk about what that looks like the antichrist will be the embodiment of all anti-christian attitudes purposes and motives that satan has ever used throughout the centuries so anything that we have ever read about what Satan has tried to do to go against God, against Christians, this, this Antichrist, this person, he will be the very embodiment of that. Uh, he's opposed to everything that Christ represents, and he is, this is the term that he's most often referred to is as the man of lawlessness from 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. He's opposed to everything. It's important. These verses, 2 Thessalonians 2, really factors in quite a bit to what we're talking about tonight. Um, there's a whole passage there, several scriptures, but here's the verses. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And we'll see the fulfillment of this as we look at what Revelation 13 says tonight. This is part of most of the abomination of desolation. That he will set himself up in God's temple saying, worship me. Worship me. Um, I won't go through every single thing here. This, this list is from uh, this book right here, uh, Revelation Unveiled by Tim LaHaye. He's one of the co-authors of the Left Behind series, if you've read any of those or heard of that. But he quoted this Dr. Clarence Larkin, uh, his book, Dis Dispensational Truth, and he gave 14, 14 contrasts between Christ and Antichrist. And we're not going to look at these scriptures, any of these scriptures. You'll be familiar with most of them. 
but just quickly I'll read through them. Christ came from above, Antichrist will ascend from the pit. Christ came in his Father's name, Antichrist will come in his own name. Christ humbled himself, Antichrist will exalt himself. Christ was despised, Antichrist will be admired. Christ will be exalted, Antichrist will be cast down to hell. Christ came and did to do his Father's will, Antichrist will come to do his own will. Christ came to save, Antichrist comes to destroy. Christ is the good shepherd, the Antichrist is the idol or the evil shepherd. We look at those verses tonight. Christ is the true vine, Antichrist is the vine of the earth. Christ is the truth, Antichrist is the lie. Christ is the holy one, Antichrist is the lawless one. Christ is the man of sorrows, Antichrist is the man of sin. Christ is the son of God, Antichrist is the son of perdition. And Christ is the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. And Antichrist will be the mystery of iniquity, Satan manifest in the flesh. Really amazing list and contrast between Christ and Antichrist. Um, and I can make copies of, I've got this all on one page. If anybody wants that, I'll, I'll be glad to make a copy of that. But I thought it was important to look at that as we're talking about these two beasts, one of them being the Antichrist tonight. So the nationality. This is what a lot of people want to know. And a lot of people will be glued to their TV set trying to figure out who out there in the world, in, in a, a particular government position, well, maybe that's the person, maybe that's the person. And I don't think we're supposed to do that because we won't know. Even if, the, even if the person who is the Antichrist is alive today, nobody knows that that's who he's going to be. Nobody knows that. We will not know because we won't be here. When he, when he is shown to be who he is, we will be long gone. So as Christians, we don't have to watch the news and wonder, well, I wonder if that's the guy, or I wonder if that's the guy, or I wonder if that's the guy. It, it doesn't really matter. Several things. In, in Revelation uh, chapter 13, we talk about the, this beast came out of the sea. Uh, there's, there's two thoughts here about what the sea represents. And, and, and almost every time that we see a reference to a body of water, an ocean or a sea in Revelation, it almost never means water. There's one thought that this sea is the sea, just the general, the sea of humanity. But very similarly related to that, it could mean, because a lot of times when the sea is referred to uh, in, in the Israel area, what's the closest, biggest body of water in Israel? The Mediterranean Sea. And so think about the Mediterranean Sea and think about the peoples and the empires that have existed around that, that Mediterranean area. So either one could seem to indicate that this person will be a Gentile. I don't think he will be fully non-Jew, and I'll explain why in, in just a minute. Then you have Daniel 8, 8 through 9, um, that suggests, and if you go back and read that, uh, it suggests, um, Daniel reads, he's interpreting this dream, and he sees this, this creature with four horns, or this, this small horn, and out of this small horn, the small horn goes away, and four other horns rise in its place. And when you go back and look at what the fulfillment of that was, um, it is when Alexander the Great initiated the rise of the Greek Empire, the Grecian Empire, he's the small horn, we believe, but when he died, there are four other Greeks who divided up the spoils. Um, so one horn get to four horns. And so Daniel, these verses make a reference to this Antichrist. And so it is possible that he will be part Greek. That's, that's out there. Then we have from Daniel chapter 9 uh, and verse 26. This refers to him. If you go back and read that verse, this is to him as the ruler of the people that will come. Now remember when Daniel is writing, he's writing about the, the people who will come, who will destroy and most scholars believe that they're talking about that this, that this Antichrist will come from the group that will destroy Jerusalem. Well, who is the last group that destroyed Jerusalem? The Romans. And so he may be predominantly Roman. Um, then we have Daniel chapter 11. And this, this context, this, this verse tells us, if you go look at these verses, it says that he, meaning the Antichrist, regards not 
the God of his fathers. Which seems to make a reference to that he has some Jewish lineage regard not the God of his fathers. So it's entirely likely, if we sum all this up, it's entirely likely, and again, we don't know, I'm not saying this is it, that he is, he looks like a Gentile, he may look predominantly Greek or Roman, but has Jewish in his background, God will know how much Jewish he is and, and whatever else, um, but if all of this is true, this makes him a Roman Gresham Jew. Hitler was partly Jewish, and he didn't really want anybody to know that. I'm going to guess, if this, is, if this is correct, that this guy won't want anybody to know that he has Jewish in his background. But if he is Gentile, Roman, Gresham, and a little bit of Jew, think about what that means. That means that he is a composite person representing all peoples of the earth. And, and there's still that belief that he will maybe look at least, you know, today if we go over to the Middle East, I wouldn't know. They probably can tell some subtle differences that you and I can't, but I'm not sure that I would know the difference between a Palestinian and a Jew and some of the other areas, uh, someone from Jordan. Uh, I'm not sure I would be able to tell the difference in what nationality they are. And, and so there's the belief that he will look Jewish and possibly be, have some Jew in him because that will be one of the things that helps to provide the counterfeit that he is the Messiah. Now what will he do? He will rise to power. First and foremost, he will rise to power. He will rise up um, and probably have some other lesser governmental positions before he ever uh, emerges on the world scene. He will propose diplomacy and not war. Uh, we know that because he's going to initiate that treaty with, uh, with Israel. Daniel 8.25 says he will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes, yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. He will cause deceit to prosper. Again, counterfeit. So he'll rise to power. He will initiate a one world government um, in Revelation 17. And we're going to uh, flip there just briefly tonight because it helps us understand what we're reading in Revelation 13. It talks about ten kings will give their power and authority to the beast. And we'll talk about what that is. But they're going to they're gonna throw all their weight behind him eventually. And everyone will support him in this one world government. Uh, this one world government will be considered the solution to all the world's problems. And think about the first major problem that's going to exist as we begin to inaugurate this end times is all these millions and millions and millions of Christians are going to be raptured and just gone. And there's going to be some tragedy that happens as a result of that. Uh, there's going to be fatalities as a result of that. Um, and then there, we're very quickly going to get into some of these judgments that are going to happen. And people are going to remember the four horsemen and all the things that come in with that. People are going to look for someone to say, I have the answers. Get behind me and follow me. Um, we see maybe a little bit of this with the United Nations today. We, we see things falling in place, but they're not 100% in place um, for, for it to line up that way. But we see things going in that direction. We're also going to, he's going to dominate the world economy. A one world government will equal a one world economy. He will control as he amasses control and everybody throws their weight behind him. That means he's going to control everything. He's going to probably control the banks. He's going to probably control every aspect of the economy. So control the monetary and the financial affairs of the world. He's going to be the man. He's going to make all the decisions, and everyone's going to have to get behind him. But they're going to want to initially because he's going to appear to have all the answers to all the world's problems. Now, I came across this as I was studying, and, and I, I didn't know this kind of thing existed. This is a book that was actually written back in 2010. Um, to, and I think this group, this World Economic Forum, I think meets annually, but they celebrated their 50th annual conference two years ago. And the theme of the conference, now think about the words here and what we're talking about uh, when the end time comes. The theme of the conference was stakeholders for a cohesive and sustainable world. And the purported goal was to overcome income inequality, societal division, and the climate crisis. And it's all based on this book, The Great Reset. And 
Part of the reason they went in this direction, and this is the chairman of this World Economic Forum, coming off the heels of the pandemic, or at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, it says the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. It's going to sound wonderful. Whatever he presents, whether it's through this organization or not, I'm not saying that it is, but there's already people out there that are trying to move the world in this direction. I didn't have any idea. I don't, I don't read about these kind of things. It doesn't come across my news feed. I had no idea. Attendees at this conference discussed fundamental changes in the traditional modes of decision making and studied a perceived need to transform healthcare, financial systems, energy production, digital oversight, and education. Is that every aspect of society? It's pretty close. There's already people trying to do this. Antichrist is going to come on the scene and everybody's going to fall behind him. And it's probably going to sound wonderful. Oh yeah, we've needed this for a long time. It's going to sound wonderful. This is how widespread people attended. 3,000 participants from 117 countries, including 53 heads of state. This is not just a novel group out there. There are important people in governments throughout the entire world that attend and are contributing to the discussion. They desire to affect the state of global relations, the direction of national economies, the priorities of society, the nature of business models, and the management of a global commons. That's their desire. They wish to usher in a new world order based on global control of just about everything. We have to know that it's out there. Moving on. He will have an atheistic religion. That'll be one of his activities. Uh, the great harlot will be a metaphor for false religion. We'll get to that in, in about a month. Uh, it will dominate, this religion will dominate all the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues of the earth. But it will eventually lose favor with the Antichrist. The false prophet will be promoting this. The false prophet's role will be to get everybody to worship the Antichrist. But eventually it will lose favor with the Antichrist who will want to receive the world's worship for himself. There will be this false religion, this combining of all the religions of the world, which blows our mind that everybody would say, yeah, let's just combine them all in one and, and give them all one name and we'll all do the same thing. And that will be promoted for the first three and a half years of the tribulation until the Antichrist about halfway through and he says, no, no, not this religion, just me. I want the entire world just to worship me. And, and, and we'll see how they will affect that. You all seen this before. This represents different types of religions or belief systems. It's already out there. There's bumper stickers. You can see them more and more. The world is big enough for different values to coexist, and this will be shoved down the world's throat as all of this starts to happen during the tribulation. We've talked many times about this covenant with Israel, this false covenant for peace for seven years. That kind of inaugurates and kicks off the tribulation. The, the Antichrist will break it halfway through. Uh, it keeps Israel from seeking God because they, they falsely are going to believe that this guy who is ushered in peace and they've been looking for the Messiah to come for the first time and they're going to believe that this is who he is. And, and we get that reference back to Daniel where he talks about the deceit, the deceit that will, that will go on. And this is where it says he will confirm a covenant. He will confirm a covenant until... The abomination of desolation happens. And then he will break his covenant and he will begin persecuting the Jews instead. Now we're going to talk about the death and resurrection. Uh, say that loosely. Um, at, at some point in the tribulation, about halfway through, the Antichrist will be indwelt by Satan. It says that scripture, that tonight when we look at it, it says that he will be fatally wounded and will die doesn't really say he will die. It will say that one of his seven heads appeared to have a fatal wound. And we'll talk about what all that could mean. But the result of all that, whether he actually dies or not, um, and I don't, I'm not sure that he completely dies, but I, I think many will believe he is dead. But all of that's going to work together because Satan indwells him. Satan is going to attempt to duplicate the resurrection of the Messiah through the Antichrist who is wounded in some way that appears to be fatal, and perhaps there will even be reports that he died. Uh, we don't really know for sure. 
And it says that because the uh, because Satan dwells him, he will have power to perform counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And again, we can go back to 2 Thessalonians 2 and see where it tells us about this. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through, through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion, the Antichrist, so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Remember, all of the judgments that we have talked about so far is not God being mean. It is God trying to get the world's attention and saying, you've got to believe that I am who I say I am before it's too late. But there will be a group that no matter what they see and no matter what they hear, they will refuse and they would rather believe the lie even though they've heard the truth. And then the last one is the destruction of the Antichrist, which we will get to. Um, our Lord Jesus Christ will destroy Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The, he will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. It says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. And this, this just this gives me chill bumps because this is how powerful God is. No matter what counterfeit whatever Satan tries to produce through the Antichrist, how will the Lord Jesus overthrow him? Just with his words. Just with the breath of his mouth. Because he's that powerful. That's, that's awesome. The present generation, this is from the Revelation unveiled by Tim LaHaye. He said, the present generation is preparing for the rule of Antichrist by its insistent, contagious desire for lawlessness. One of the plaguing problems of the younger generation is that of rebellion against law and order and a desire to reject restraint. Instead of morality, honesty, and decency based on the fixed standard of God's word, we find immorality and self-expression. Self-indulgence is the watchword of life today. And this will grow at a rate and be at a level that we can't fathom when the tribulation is, is going on on this earth. So that's all background. We haven't even gotten into Revelation 13. But that gives us a description of what we're going to see about the Antichrist as we go from beginning in chapter 13 and as he keeps popping up until his destruction near the end of, of Revelation. So let's stop here and, and pray that God will help us to understand his words in Revelation 13 and then we're going to look at it tonight. God, we're thankful for today. We're thankful to be able to come and study your word. Uh, Lord, there are things that we don't understand that you don't you don't reveal to us, but you ask us to, to dig in uh, for you to reveal yourself to us, what you want us to understand. And Lord, we, we know if nothing else that what we see here is to know that there is a promise of your victory. And no matter what the world can put out there for others to believe in, uh, no matter what lie is out there, no matter what counterfeit is out there, nothing will stop your plan from going forward. And you will be victorious. In fact, you're already victorious because you've conquered sin and death. And Lord, we just pray that we would be wise in, in understanding what your word is. That we would be discerning. Because there are supernatural things out there that are not necessarily from you. And, and we don't want to be deceived. And Lord, we just pray that you would reveal yourself to us as we look at these verses from Revelation 13 tonight. We're thankful that you are here with us and that you speak to us through your word. It's your name we pray. So verses 1 and 2, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. So what in the world is what in the world is, is this mean? So first we want to look at the wickedness of the Antichrist, okay? And that's already evident to us, but he's a real person. We've already said he'll be possessed by Satan. 
These verses tell us that the dragon, which we know is Satan from last week, will give him his power, his throne, and his authority. And I want you to turn with me. Um, I didn't put it up here, I don't think. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 17, uh, if you're there. And let's look at um, those verses. Let me make sure I didn't put it up here. Oh, I didn't. There we go. There we go. I put it in here. So we get ahead to 17, and this is going to help us to try to understand what we just read in the description of the, of the seven heads and the ten horns and the crowns. So in this section it says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven heels on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Is that cleared up? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Me either. Me either. All right. So let's try and break it down. So the woman, when we get to chapter 17, the woman is going, is not a real woman. Uh, she's going to represent a system. Uh, we have the same beast described here in Revelation 17 as what we're talking about uh, back in Revelation 13. And it says that the seven heads are seven heels on which the woman sits. Now, there is an argument out there, a strong argument, and many believe this, that the seven heels, that this is a reference to the seven heels of Rome that, that Rome was built on. And then it, it continues that analogy on out there and even gets to the, to the uh, conclusion that if the seven heels are the seven heels of Rome, then the Antichrist is the Pope. And that is strongly believed by a lot of, a lot of people out there, okay? Um, I, I don't think that's what this is talking about uh, when we get in here. It says that the seven heads are seven heels, and then it, it tells us that uh, there are seven kings, and you can't be a king without having a kingdom. Now, if you go back and look at the, at the verse, it says they are also seven kings. That's why I don't think it's the seven heels. Five have fallen kingdoms. Okay, five kings and kingdoms have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. So five have fallen. John is speaking in past tense. So the five that have fallen are Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire. Five have fallen. Five dominant world empires that already are done. One is, and at the time that John is writing this, what is the dominant world empire? It's Rome. One is. The other has not yet come. And we've been looking at how that other that has not yet come is, the, is this ten nation confederation that Daniel talks about that says that that's where the Antichrist will come from. So five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. Five have fallen. Past tense. One is. Roman Empire. The other has not yet come. Daniel describes his ten nation, and he says that he will, in Daniel's, or verse 10, says, uh, in Revelation 17, says he will remain only a little while, and it says the beast is an eighth king. So the ten nation confederation will, will exist for a very short while, about the first half of the tribulation. That will be this seventh kingdom, the seventh head. It will only exist for a little while, but then the Antichrist it says that, uh, Scripture says that three, three of the rulers of the Ten Nation Confederation will throw their weight behind him, and then eventually all of them will. And so the beast, who is the beast? The beast is the Antichrist. He will actually be an eighth king because halfway through the tribulation, it will just be him, a one-man world empire, not a group, not a country. Okay? It will just be him. Now, Daniel sees a lion, a bear, and a leopard, like things that were like a lion and a bear and a leopard. He's talking about governments that are coming. John sees the features of a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Notice the reverse order. Daniel sees them in this order. John sees them in the opposite order. Daniel's looking forward to the kingdoms that have not yet come. John's looking backwards to the kingdoms that have already been. Really fascinating to look at it that way and see how God is working that together hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of years apart. Okay? 
So I hope that makes a little bit more sense. The seven heads, seven kingdoms. The um, we go back, we go all the way back to it. It had ten horns, ten nation confederation, seven heads representing the seven kingdoms with ten crowns, the ten kings from the ten nation confederation. Okay, and and we can't forget. On top of all that, he has this blasphemous name on every head. So every evil that is out there is going to blaspheme God. The next verses. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? So we have this wounding. Some There is some thought out there that because it's talking about one of the seven heads, and it doesn't specify which, that it's talking about possibly the wounding is referring to the fall of the Roman Empire and that this ten-nation confederation will be a resurgence or a revival of, of that Roman Empire. That, that argument is out there, and, and that may be right. Uh, but there's a great deal of uh, belief out there that this wounding is a literal wounding and perhaps a fatal blow to the Antichrist. Revelation uh, 13 mentions three times about the fatal wound that had been healed. Now, there, there's a possibility to receive a fatal wound, but somehow medical technology is able to do stuff where you don't actually die from it. So I don't really know. We, we don't really know. I don't know whether the Antichrist will really die from whatever this wound is. But it's really interesting as Zechariah talks about this. This is really interesting um, verses that go in with this. Then the Lord said to me, take again the equipment of a foolish shepherd. Uh, in some translations, this is the reference to the idle shepherd. Or um, this is a, so Jesus is the good shepherd. Antichrist is this foolish shepherd. For I am going to raise up a shepherd over the land who will not care for the lost or seek the young or heal the injured or feed the healthy, but will eat the meat of the choice sheep, tearing off their hooves. Woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. May his arm be completely withered, his right eye totally blinded. And quite a few scholars believe that this is talking about that fatal wound to the Antichrist, perhaps leaving him permanently maimed in some way, right arm and right eye. Don't know if it'll be a gunshot wound. No idea. No idea. Don't know if he will really die. But the world is going to see this happen because he's going to be on the media all the time everywhere the world's going to see this happen and whatever it is however all this plays out satan is going satan is going to indwell him and the world is going to be con convinced that he has come back to life somehow some way and, and, and i hate and i don't think we should use the word miracle because i don't think that's the right word to use but i don't have a substitute for it jesus said that no sign would be given to the people except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We know that Christianity is unique in that we worship a resurrected living Lord. So this may be the deceitful tool that Satan uses to deceive humankind Especially for the people who are still looking for a Messiah, particularly the Jewish people who many of them are still looking for a Messiah to come the first time. And so it may deceive them and people say, this is it. This is him. This is him. It's the fulfillment of, it's the fulfillment of what Jonah said. And so people are going to worship. Uh, that, that verse said that people worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and they ask the questions. Who is like the beast? Wow, who's like him? Isn't he awesome? That's what the world, that's what the world will do. Thousands of people. However, this all plays out, and it appears that he has been revived. 
However that plays out, thousands of people are going to, who have previously been undecided, are going to decide to worship him. And he's going to call them to worship him. And all the deceit will be there to fool them that that is who that he should worship. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months, second half of the tribulation. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. So he comes, he, this is the wielded power of the Antichrist now. Nothing can stop him now. No one will oppose him. He comes to full power. The, the last three and a half years of the tribulation, there will be continuous blasphemy against God and Jesus. He will probably mock Christianity um, because he's going to say, I don't, I don't care what you believed before, but I'm who you should be worshiping. I, I am Messiah is what he is going to say. And then we looked at these verses. Uh, I mentioned this before. The king, referring to the Antichrist, says, will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. The time of wrath is Jesus' second coming. For what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the god of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. And so again, this reference to he will show no regard for the god of his ancestors. This is where we get the idea that he will have some Jew, some Jewish in his background. Now, what does it mean for the one desired by women? He will have no regard for the one desired by women. The one desired by women, as Daniel is writing this, remember, Messiah has not come, so the one desired by women is the Messiah. Every Jewish girl hoped and prayed that they would be the vessel through which God would bring Messiah. So he will have no regard for the God of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, Messiah. Second Thessalonians, talking about him, says he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. <coughs> the deceit to fool everyone. Worship me. Verse 7. It, so in the beast, was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So here we see the warfare of the Antichrist. All unbelievers will worship Antichrist because he's going to force an ultimatum. Who are you going to, you going to worship? And if you don't worship me, then he's going to kill you. And he's going to, it's going to be this false pretense that they should worship anyone. They'll want to. Those who come to faith during the tribulation will know not to worship him because they will have already made up their mind. Uh, we talked last week. They will not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And they will stand on the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They will know not to. Okay? This is important when we get into talking about the mark of the beast here at the end. Again, from Tim LaHaye, he said, It is evident today that human beings seek to worship what they can see. During the tribulation period, Satan will provide a visible God with seemingly divine powers. Those who prefer a comfortable religion that does not demand righteous behavior will find just what they are looking for. Exactly what you're looking for. John tells us, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him when Jesus was on the earth the first time. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This Lamb's Book of Life, that's, that's the whole key. Your name's either in it, in it or not. 
there's, there's no middle ground. There's no last second additions. Um, after, after Jesus comes back, there's no last second additions. Um, but it says um, that all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, um, that's who will worship. All those whose names are not written in that book is who's going to worship this beast. The Lamb's Book of Life. It will never be blotted out. Never be blotted out. Once it's there, it's in, it's in permanent marker. And it finishes out this section talking about the Antichrist saying, Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. The last time we heard the phrase, Whoever has ears, let them hear, was back in Revelation chapter 2 as he was talking to uh, the churches. And there it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. By this time, there is no Spirit to talk to anyone. The Spirit is not, the Spirit is not here because God has taken his church home. There will still be believers. But now it doesn't say, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jeremiah says, and if they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death to death. Those for the sword to the sword. Those for starvation to starvation. Those for captivity to captivity. It's really similar to this. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. It is what it is. If you have chosen against God, Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And nothing's going to stop it at this point. So that's the Antichrist. He's the primary figure of these, of these two beasts in chapter 13. But then we still have the second beast. Okay? The false prophet and the mark of the beast. That's what we have to do uh, to finish up our time. So verse 11 introduces this second beast. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Now some translations would say, then I saw another beast and that's really the better translation because that word uh, another is that, like we looked at before when we were talking about uh, one of the angels, it means, uh, it's the Greek word alos, another of the same kind. So uh, we had the beast from the uh, sea, and now we saw a second beast coming out of the earth. And so we got another of the same kind, uh, another beast. It comes from the earth or the land. And, and land is a good translation, and, and th this is just a guess. Okay, this is just a guess. Um, don't know this for sure. But Daniel refers to Israel three different times as the beautiful land. Okay? This is a beast who comes out of the earth or the land. So again, there is a probability, there's a chance, we don't know, that this false prophet, this second beast, comes from the land that he also will be Jewish. That he, or he will have Jewish in him. Because again, together, both beasts, the false prophet and the Antichrist, are going to deceive, first, the nation of Israel, because they're waiting for Messiah to come. They're waiting for peace. They, they believe, we talked about this a few weeks ago, they believe that they will know that the Messiah has come because Messiah will let us rebuild our temple. And that's what Antichrist is going to do before we even necessarily, before the world even necessarily knows that he's the Antichrist. And it says the second beast operates from the power of Satan as a spiritual figure or leader. Um, and we can see the, the word false prophet does not show up here in verse 13, um, but it does references to him, and that phrase are found in these other places in Revelation. We're not down to verse 16 yet, but it says, It, meaning the beast, also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. So this beast is going to require that. In 1920 it says, But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf, 
with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Reference to false prophet here. And then also in chapter 20. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. They won't be just destroyed and killed. They will, they will be tormented forever and ever and ever. So the false prophet, notice the description of it. It says that it had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. So what, what does that mean? Well, lambs don't have horns. So that's weird right in and of itself, uh, because a lamb does not have a, a horn. Horn itself refers to authority or power or strength. And the number two refers to testimony. Uh, just like today, when you are going to testify, if, if witnesses are called in, if they're wanting to get um, corroboration that so-and-so did such and such, one witness is not always enough, but two is. There is strength in the witness of two. And so the two symbolizes the testimony and the authority. He is going to give this testimony and this authority um, to him uh, along. So, so, the, so both beasts are going to promote Satan. Okay? And notice that he comes like a lamb. It says that he comes like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. And the dragon is Satan. So the lamb represents religion and the dragon represents deception. And his role is to deceive everyone and to promote worship first of this false religion, this one world religion. First is to promote that. And then secondly, it will be solely to promote the worship of the Antichrist. Now when we start talking about these two beasts, um, you have probably read somewhere a reference to the unholy trinity. Again, Satan tries to counterfeit everything of God. And so you have Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet representing a counterfeit version of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. In, 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 our, in our trinity, the holy trinity, you have Jesus always exalts God the Father, and the Spirit always exalts Jesus. In this counterfeit, you have um, the dragon is empowering the Antichrist. The Antichrist exalts Satan, and the false prophet exalts the Antichrist. Counterfeit version of what God has made that is good and holy. Verse 13, and yet the beast performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So we're talking about some supernatural stuff here. Okay, some supernatural stuff. Um, you know, God, but here's a better way to think of it. Even though this is going to look like supernatural stuff and these beasts doing these things, God, God equals supernatural. Look at, look down here the fourth one. God can do the supernatural. The devil can do the supernormal. It will look like supernatural, but it's really not. And this is a good comparison, uh, I think, of what we're talking about. And it looks really similar, but it's not. God is infinite in power. The devil and his demons are finite beings and therefore limited in power. They were made by God. The power of God can create life. The devil cannot create life. Now, somehow, this second beast, this false prophet, some, there's going to be some kind of an image of uh, the first beast, the Antichrist, that will be set up in that temple and it says that he will give it breath, so apparently it will at least have the ability somehow to speak. I don't think it, I don't, we don't know. We don't know what it will be. I don't, it's not giving it life because that's not the, that's not the word that he uses here. Uh, it's, not, it's not the word based on, uh, you know, based on biology of giving things life. Um, 
You know, God alone has the power to raise the dead. The devil cannot raise the dead. We talked about the next one. God can control the natural laws and do whatever he wants. The devil cannot control the natural laws. He cannot bend them around to do different things. And God, being all-powerful, performs true miracles. Um, and Satan, with his vast knowledge of God, man, and the universe, can perform lying wonders often to deceive people. They will look like it, but they're really not. They're really not. Jesus said, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So even though we won't be here and we won't see these things that are counterfeit of God, it's still important for us to understand today because there are still supernatural or supernormal things going on out there. And some people will see a supernormal something or other, and they will automatically, because it is beyond their imagination and understanding, they will automatically say, well, that's from God. Jesus said, no, there will be many who will come and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So we have to be careful. We have to measure everything against what God's Word says so that we're not fooled right now today. Even though that we know we're not going to be here, if God comes back before we die, we're going to be raptured away and we won't see any of this. But even, even if that doesn't happen, while we're alive on this earth, we don't want to be fooled and start following something that is a supernormal and is of evil because it looks supernatural. And that's only God. Paul wrote about Satan and said, For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Uh, and we have to, it's important to think about what that means is because the devil wants us to think that he is good. He wants us to think that he is truthful, that he is loving and powerful. All the things that God is. And there's all those pictures out there of the devil with the, with the horns and, the, you know, and, and he looks gruesome and grotesque and all those kind of things. But portraying him that way, he doesn't want to be portrayed that way because that's not very attractive. Why would I want to follow something like that? So he masquerades as an angel of light. Most people are not drawn to darkness. They're drawn to the light. And so Satan appears as this creature of light to draw people to himself, to draw people to the lies. He's also described as the thief that comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he's all about, to destroy every aspect of a person's life that he possibly can because he knows that his fate is sealed and he wants to take as many people with him as possible. He wants to take as many people with him. So how can we discern which light is of God and which light is of Satan? And how can we make sure we are on the right path? All kinds of scripture that tells us, and we hear this almost every week. This is the longest psalm uh, out there. It's full of, of verses along with other psalms, but these are two good verses from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. And the revelation of your words brings light and gives understanding to the inexperienced. We, our minds and our hearts can easily be confused by conflicting messages. God's words have power. God, God's voice spoke physical light into existence. It can speak spiritual light into our hearts and into our minds. And so we have to be exposed to his words. Now, think back to those verses. It said, it performed great signs, it being the second beast, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Now, this, this is really important to the deceit and the counterfeit, okay? Who do we know called fire down from heaven in the Old Testament? Elijah, okay? Elijah did. We know that there's still a great number of Jews that are looking for Jesus to come the first time. Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, so for Jews, for Jews, this is the end of their scripture, this is, the la this is the last word from God that they have heard according to what they believe. And this is at the very end, last chapter toward the very end of Malachi. He says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. It tells the Jews, 
Malachi predicts and says that Elijah will come before the Messiah. Okay? So for a strict Jew, they this is the end of their scriptures. Now, we know from the New Testament, for Christians, the New Testament, additional scriptures, in Luke it says, and he, referring to John the Baptist, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay? This is what Luke, Luke records. And then in Matthew, that's not right. I didn't write that up there. In Matthew, Jesus verified that this was true. And let me read it to you. It says, the disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law, Malachi, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. So Jesus tells us that what Malachi predicted has already happened. But for Jews that don't believe that Messiah has already come, they don't believe that Elijah has come yet. They don't believe that Malachi's prophecy has occurred. So when, so when we go back to that verse, when the false prophet, the second beast, is able to call down fire from heaven, they are going to say, it's Elijah. It's Elijah. And what is the false prophet doing? He is saying, worship the first beast, the Antichrist. And so they're going to believe that the false prophet is Elijah. And they're going to believe that the Antichrist is Messiah. Counterfeit, but looks really similar. And looks like it is fulfilling exactly what Scripture says. In Jewish Orthodox, the strictest Jewish Orthodox homes today, they still sit in an empty chair at their Passover meal. And that chair is for Elijah. They're still waiting for Elijah to come in fulfillment of what Malachi said. Many will be deceived. And then in the verses 14 and 15, it says, uh, talks about that image being set up. Um, and it says that it will cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. So Antichrist is going to set himself up first. Then there's some kind of idol is going to be set up in the image of him. It will be given breath, not life. Um, this, that's the abomination of desolation. People are forced to worship this image or be killed. That's it. Okay? So they're going to be forced to worship or be killed. How will people be forced to worship the Antichrist? How will that happen? Well, let's look at the last verses. It, meaning that second beast, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. What is the mark of the beast? We don't know. <laughs> That's the short, easy answer. We don't know. People have tried to figure this out forever, and you can read every <coughs> imaginable and unimaginable theory out there. The most recent theory was that the COVID vaccine was the mark of the beast. Okay? So that's really recent. All right? So here's what we know about this mark of the beast. Let me say this first before I go over the slide. Um, the tool, the method of getting people to worship, of getting people to worship this, uh, this Antichrist and this image of him, this tool is going to be an economic tool. When it's presented, and it's going to sound really good. Again, it's going to sound really good. Yes, we should do this. Yes, I want that. Where do I go get in line? I want to be first. Uh, you know, people go camp out uh, waiting to buy the first ticket to an athletic event. I want to be first in line. I'm going to get the first ticket. Um, people are going to, I think people will do that to go stand in line to get whatever this mark is, whatever it is. Um, you know, 20 years ago, people thought the mark of the beast was credit cards uh, because they started having that magnetic strip on the back of it. And then it started having that little, that little hologram thing on it. Now it's got the little chip in it, and we've got to have the chip reader. And so people get freaked out every time there's a change to the credit cards. 
And then we have uh, the technology that's been around for a while, the, the medical implant chips that you can insert into animals um, so that you can find them. Uh, if they get lost and, and they put it in the same place all the time and you can just scan it and it'll pull up all the information about its owner and that kind of thing. People, people think that that could be. Um, people think that it'll be some kind of a barcode, all those barcodes, uh, because people think, well, yeah, we'll just, the Mark of the Beast will be some kind of a barcode that I'll either put on my forehead or, or put here. Uh, I won't have to use my iPhone and um, uh, I won't have to use an uh, iPad. I'll just put my head down there and swipe it. And I can buy it I don't have to have anything with me. You know, people think that kind of thing that, that's out there. Uh, there's been all kinds of wild speculation when Ronald Reagan was alive. Uh, Ronald, Ronald Reagan's full name is Ronald Wilson Reagan. He has three names, and each of them are six letters. It's, oh, he's, he's, he's it. He's, he's the Antichrist because his number is 666. And no, that's, no, no, he wasn't. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't him. We don't know what the mark of the, of the beast is. Um, I will say this. And it says, notice that it says, um, this calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. Again, we just don't know how they, how is this going to be come up with? It will be, it will be determined and figured out when all of this happens. Uh, there's some speculation that the 666 really doesn't even mean that actual number because the number 7 represents perfection in God and the number 6 is considered the number of man. So they think maybe the 666 is just being symbolic about this person. But here, here's an interesting thought that ties in with this is that Hebrew, like Arabic, and just a few other ancient languages, um, those are languages that have alphanumerics assigned to every letter. And so um, in Sunday school this morning, we were talking about, you know, Ezra, and he was going back and he was pulling those scrolls and reading from the Torah. Uh, and and we, we have often, you've probably wondered, like I have, how did they copy it accurately without ever making a mistake? I just thought they were just super meticulous and they just, you know, double and triple and quadruple checked it. Uh, but when I read this, because Hebrew uh, and, and some of those other languages, because there's alphanumerics assigned to every letter, they would go through what they were getting ready to copy off of, and they would add it up. And it would equal a number at the end of each line. And then they would go over here, and they would copy it, and then they would add it up. And if this didn't equal the same number as back here, they would start all over again. Because there's numbers assigned to each letter. And so, could this have something to do with that? Maybe. We don't know. We just, we just don't know. Um, let me go back to this slide. Here's what we do know. The mark of the beast will be deliberately identified. The people that go stand in line and I want my mark and they'll be proud to get it, whichever spot they get it on their forehead or their right hand, they'll be proud because it will identify them with who they believe is, the, is God. And I'm proud to get mine. Okay? Deliberately identified. Some Christians worry that they, you know, again, go back to credit cards and uh, barcodes and uh, some kind of implanted chip because there's all kinds of technology growing in leaps about. It will be deliberately identifying and nobody, nobody that's a Christian alive right now or at any time before all of this happens, you don't have to worry about accidentally getting the mark of the beast. You don't have to worry about it. It's not a vaccine. Okay? We don't have to worry about accident. It will be a deliberate decision that identifies you with the beast. It, it is an intentional rejection of Christ. I don't believe this. I don't believe what I've heard. Next week we're going to see, or two, in two weeks we're going to see in chapter 14, there is a specific angel whose job is going to be to go throughout the earth proclaiming Christ. So if you haven't already heard it from the 144,000 or anybody else that has accepted Jesus during this time period, there will be an angel and everyone will hear what he says. But people still go stand in line to get the mark. No, I don't believe that. No, I'd rather believe this instead. Where do I get my mark? How quickly can I get it? <coughs> and then the mark will also indicate loyalty and devotion. It's not taken accidentally, but it signifies loyalty and devotion to the beast. This is where it says in Revelation what we'll look at in two weeks. Look what it says. 
The third, a third angel followed them and said with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. This is irreversible. Once you go stand in line and get it, whatever it is, you will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. No turning back. People will be warned, but there will be no turning back. Questions from tonight. That's a lot of stuff about those two beasts. Any questions? We're, we're two weeks. We're in chapter 14. Let me put up my, my resources and, and questions. Did I understand that when Jesus said that Elijah had already come, that that was represented by John the Baptist? Yes. Yes. And his disciples understood it after he explained it to them. Yes. You said something. You said the Spirit of God will not be here during the time of, of all that's going on. There will be believers, yes. But they, but they will not have I don't, I don't think so. I haven't read anything extensively on that, but I keep hearing and reading different things that indicate that God's Spirit, because He's already raptured His church, even though these will be believers or tribulation saints or whatever you want to call them, that they won't be necessarily filled with the Spirit. I mean, they will still be believers, and I mean, I think they will be, you know, they will not shrink from death. I mean, their faith will be strong. Um, that, that's what I have read. I, I can't tell you conclusively, but the Spirit is what is restraining evil in the world right now. And so that, that leads me to conclude that the, the Spirit won't be present uh, on the earth at that time because evil will run amok more than it ever has before. The believers will be saved after the rapture. Yes. Yes. There will be, there'll be millions of people who will be saved. Millions and millions and millions. But there will also be millions and there will be billions who will not. Because we've already looked at, you know, what? At least six billion who will die. Or four billion that will die. Maybe a couple billion that have been raptured. And then at least four billion that will die in one form or fashion through the judgments. And, and more death is coming. I mean, more judgment is coming and more death is coming. Any other questions? Oh, I don't have a question, but I talked to a Cocker family today, and hospice has been called in, and days have been talked about. So a member of the Cocker's family. Brother Paul went and visited today and um, said he grabbed his hand, and, and there, were, there were tears in his eyes, and he seemed to understand what was being said. The family has requested that no one uh, go and visit. They already have lots of family there, um, so they're requesting that nobody come up and visit, but... Hospice has been called in, uh, and they're talking, it's, it's hours or days, uh, is what they're talking about. Remember the real family. Any other questions? Anybody else, anything tonight? Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your truth. We're thankful that your word is always true. And Lord, our prayer tonight is even though we are comforted that we will not be here during this time, if you come back and rapture um, your church away, we know we won't be here during that time if that happens in our lifetime. Um, but, but we still want to be mindful of your truth and, and what is true and what is holy and what is right and what is of you and, and what is false because there is still a lot of false out there uh, around us today. And a lot of people follow that. And so, Lord, help us to be uh, contributors to your truth that others would uh, see your truth in us um, and, and how, how we live our lives, um, the, how we do things, um, how we talk, how we love on other people. Help others to see your truth through, uh, through us. Um, Lord, we're, we're thankful. Um, again, we're, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful that all authority has been given to him, and that he's in control. And Lord, he is, he is going to finish off this, this evil that we can't fathom. He's going to finish them off with his breath, and they'll be done. And you have you have foretold that um, since since before the creation of the world. And so we're thankful that you keep all your promises, but we're thankful that you love us, and we're thankful that our names are in that Lamb's Book of Life that can never be blotted out. But we pray that others that we come in contact with 
would come to believe in you, that their name would be written there as well, that they can spend eternity with you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.